Okay, we start. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce Professor Martin Dufenberg, who is a, a not only a brilliant researcher, but also a very kind person. So I'm very happy that you are here with us. He is uh, spending a period uh, at Bocconi University, and uh, I think it's a quite long uh, standing uh, time that he will spend there. He is uh, an experimental economist, a behavioral economist, uh, and uh, the field of research he covers is a quite wide one. Recently, well, he is a game theory theoretician as well, and uh, well, the, the, the main part of his uh, scientific production is a sort of crossroad between uh, economic uh, uh, game theory and uh, behavioral economics. He will, uh, I, I, will, I, will, I will be very short so I can, I, I leave you the time to, to introduce uh, your, your talk. Uh, I just sp spend a couple of uh, words to say that uh, um, what we are speaking today here is about a very innovative uh, and challenging way to study economics, which is to do it by using a laboratory. A uh, laboratory in social sciences is something recently, recent, uh, relatively recent, because they started many years ago already. Uh, we have a a laboratory in Trento as well, uh, which is uh, the, the Cognitive and Experimental Economics Laboratory. We started about 22 years ago. Uh, we were the first laboratory of this kind uh, in Italy. And uh, for this reason, I think that uh, you will find uh, a group of people here following you very, very, very warmly. Thank you very much. You, you must Thanks a lot, uh, Luigi, for this introduction. It's really spectacular and fun to be here. Thank you all for coming. I know I had tough, tough competition with uh, uh, Matteo Renzi being in, 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 in an adjacent room somewhere. Uh, I want to say thanks also to Federico Fornasari, who is uh, Luigi's uh, PhD student, who, who, who um, has helped me uh, settle in here in, in, in Trento and told me about his interesting work about risk preferences and social preferences. I will talk about other themes, uh, but also related to experimental methods. All right. Uh, Luigi, you said something about 30 minutes. Uh, 30 seconds, okay, it's been, okay, okay, very good. Uh, so I think I'm gonna stand up because I need to point to my slides and so on. Let's see, uh, can you hear me well if I talk like this? Yes, even like this? Okay, okay, I'll, I'll try to go like this. Okay, the topic of uh, the day is leadership in the lab. So, um, as uh, Luigi mentioned, you know, I do work on game theory, on, on uh, experimental economics, on incorporating psychology into economic analysis using uh, game theory and the experimental method. I hope you will get a little glimpse of all these things, but it will be a more specific topic today, namely leadership in the lab. And now I don't know how to switch the slide. How do I do that? Oh, right. Yes. Okay. Um, before I come to the topic of leadership, let me say something broadly about uh, experimental economics, a topic some of you may, some of you may not have heard about. And uh, uh, Luigi also indicated a little bit. It uh, concerns using the experimental method to learn about economic issues, one way or another. And there are different ways you can do this, and in, in a one-hour talk like this, one or one-hour plus talk like this, uh, I will not have an opportunity to mention all of them, um, uh, but uh, a leading instance would be what I've written about here on, uh, on my slides, and it's related to economic theory, okay? So what do economic theorists do? 
economic theorists tell stories about how the world works. They look at thought up worlds and sort of uh, try to, or maybe not thought up worlds, they may be inspired by uh, uh, the real economy and trying to get sort of assess the uh, anatomy of how things hang together. And you know, a large part of economic scholarship is is concerned with postulating assumptions and sort of telling a theoretical story about how uh, uh, the economy might work. Okay, that's interesting and valuable in its own right. And many scholars will will uh, uh, be satisfied with doing only this. You have lots of publications in economics that are just economic theory. However, you know, uh, these stories about how the world might work are, of course, even more important to the extent that they are empirically relevant. And uh, 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 a big chunk of experimental economics is concerned with taking economic theory uh, as a starting point, and then asking, is this theory uh, credible? Does it come alive? You know, is it empirically relevant? And uh, this is the per specific perspective I, I will be having in mind when I talk today. Now, before I come to the specific theory, I will look at uh, we've mentioned lab experiments. You may wonder what a lab looks like. This is our lab at Bocconi. It's called the Bocconi Experimental Laboratory in the Social Sciences. And um, maybe I'll hold it like this. And um, uh, you see a picture here. Uh, you can, the picture is slightly blurry, but you can get a sense there are cubicles. You know, students will be invited to the lab each student will be seated by in one of these cubicles and then they have a computer screen in front of them they will be getting uh, in, in instructions and opportunities to make decisions uh, um, you know games that they might be involved in will be described to them markets they might interact in will be presented to them and they will be making decisions maybe buying and selling decisions maybe uh, bidding decisions in an auction and so forth and at the end of the session there will be real payoff consequences where they are they are paid in accordance to the economic outcomes generated in the lab so you know the theorist will be telling stories about economic interaction and then in the lab you actually provide settings that match the theory including uh, uh, paying subjects right so you know you really try to replicate the the uh, conditions described in the theory in the lab setting. Uh, I hope I'm not, uh, am, am I jumping in and out of the microphone too much or is it okay the way I'm talking? Yes? It's, I'm, yes. Now, uh, this was a little bit by way of introduction about economic theory in general and, and the experimental method. Now I will be more specific. So when uh, Tito Boeri approached me and asked if I uh, could speak at the conference, you know, uh, he mentioned that the topic was uh, uh, the ruling class and leadership, right? So I agreed to talk about leadership in the lab. I did that uh, whilst having done no work on leadership or almost no work on leadership myself. Okay, so uh, uh, I, I warn you that I'm not an exper expert on leadership, but when I got the task, I set myself uh, to explore um, uh, a little bit, to learn about the literature on leadership from an economics point of view. There is a lot of literature in, in neighboring fields, in management, in organizational psychology, Okay, but I'm an economist, and economists have written, it turns out, when I checked, surprisingly little about leadership. I mean, you could almost say there is almost nothing. There is, however, something, and the little there is tends to tell snapshot stories to highlight some key issues that may be relevant to leadership. Okay, and I will, in this lecture, highlight 
two such snapshot stories and mention related experiments. So there will be sort of two parts to each story first, where I invite you to reflect on and try to appreciate the, the uh, theoretical storytelling, if you will, as interesting in its own right. And then you should get curious about, okay, we just heard a story about how the world may work. Is it empirically relevant? Okay. The first story is going to be based on theory, which I had no part of. It's done by Mana Kumai, uh, Mark Stegeman, and Ben Hermelin, who published a paper in the American Economic Review in 2007. I put in a picture of Mana and, and, and uh, her uh, co-authors uh, to the right. Um, uh, she was also involved in an experiment with uh, Phil Grossman and Travis Dieters. So Travis Dieters is missing from the pictures, but the other authors are there. All right, so we start with theory. So let me now give you a simplified account of the theory of Kumai, Stegman, and Hermelin. So they consider a setting with teamwork, okay? So imagine that you have a group of people who work in a team, and we stylize this teamwork very much and say that each individual in the team has a choice, a binary choice. The individual can either exert effort, work hard, or not do so, okay? And imagine that there is a cost of working hard. You know, it's easier to relax and not, not put in too much, much effort. So there will be a cost of working hard, and I'm going to parameterize and have numbers, okay, to generate payoffs. So let's say that there is a cost, and we'll give it a number. It's going to be three. So if you exert cost at work, uh, sorry, work hard, you have to pay a working hard cost of three. On the other hand, you cannot work hard, and then you don't have a cost. It's zero, okay? Think of that as shirking or not working hard. The good thing with effort, however, is that it benefits the whole team. Everyone benefits. The organization benefits, right? And I'm going to have a parameter for how much that benefit is, and I'll call it x. So x is going to be a number, and we look at different numbers of x. So think of it as for each individual who puts in effort, everyone in the team gets x, right? So for any given person exerting effort, everyone in the team gets X. Okay. Now I'm going to simplify further and assume that the team actually consists of only two individuals. Okay. Everything I say and, you know, the authors actually look at richer settings with more individuals and more complications, but I'm going to look at a setting with just two players. And then, it turns out that for a given x, you get what game theorists will be call, would call a game. So I think as much as learning about, maybe even more than learning about the experimental uh, method in this talk, you will learn about game theory, okay? Because my theories will be game theory based, and, and I'll have to introduce key game theoretic concepts to you, and I hope you will enjoy that. So here we go. Okay, what I just said on the previous slide can be described again using this matrix. This is a, what game theorists would call a game matrix, okay? It depicts the st strategic situation I just described. There are three things to note to, this, to, to learn, okay, in line with what I had on the previous slide. First of all, you have two individuals interacting. They are called players in game theory, okay? I'll use the term player. So one of the players is choosing a row. There are two rows here, okay? And let's call that player, player one, let's say. Player one chooses either E for exerting effort or N for not exerting effort, okay? If I'm unclear, you know, please raise your hand if you want to ask a clarifying question. But, but you know, you have the first player choosing uh, e or N, a row. Then you have the other player, at the same time, 
choosing also E or N for effort or no effort, that corresponds to columns, right? So one of the players choosing rows, the other one chooses columns. That means since you have two rows and two columns, you have two times two equals four combinations corresponding to the, the boxes in the matrix, okay? They correspond to outcomes. So there are four possibilities. Both of them choose E, high effort. Neither of them choose uh, N. That would be uh, the outcome down here, okay? And then the two other outcomes where one of them chooses effort and the other one not chooses effort, right? Okay, in line with what I said on the previous slide, we've, I've now done uh, uh, two of the three things I wanted to say. I wanted to tell you who the players are, and they are two, and one chooses rows, one chooses columns. The other thing was to describe what they could do, and that was the effort and the no, the, the thing, the E's and the N's here, right? The effort and the no effort. The thing that remains is the payoffs. What do they earn? Okay, and these are the numbers written in the cells. Remember, the cells or the boxes correspond to outcomes, and in each box I've written two numbers. Okay, in an attempt to be pedagogical, I've written the payoff of player one, the one choosing rows, to the left and below, okay, and the one to the other player to the right and above. So, for instance, um, uh, you know, if you take the case where none of them exerts effort, well, they're not going to have any, 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 any nice X to enjoy, and, uh, you know, but they won't pay any cost. So they get zero each, right? And that's what I've written in the cell. Zero for the row player, zero for the column player, right? Uh, of course, if both of them, or uh, well, let's say one of them exerts effort, let's suppose player one exerts effort and the other one does not, then we end up in the top right cell, okay? What are the payoffs going to get be? Well, since there is one unit of effort provided, in this case by player one, both of them are gonna get X, because that's what I said about X, right? For each unit of effort, everyone gets X. But the person exerting effort is going to have to pay a cost, not the other one, right? And the cost is three. So it's going to be x minus three for the first player and x for the second player. x minus three for the first player and x for the second player, right? Of course, if you have the opposite outcome where player one does not exert effort and player two does, you get payoffs x and x minus three. Okay. So this was my attempt to explain this game matrix. Okay. Now think of x, that's, you know, I'm keeping the cost of effort fixed at three. But I'm going to start varying, playing around with x. Of course, x is what everyone gets if you have a unit of effort, right? And oh, I forgot to say that, of course, if both of them exert effort, we go to the top left corner. Here. Right? Then, since there are two units of effort provided, one by each person, they each get 2x. But they also each have to pay a cost of 3, so 2x minus 3. I hope you've followed this presentation of the matrix. Now I'm going to look at different at games that differ in terms of the x. So think of x as a productivity parameter. The higher it is, the more gains there are from exerting effort. Did I have a question? Uh, it's not clear at the first, uh, the first one. Two uh, x less three. Yes. Okay. Let let me. Uh, so the question concerns the top left box. Okay. Thanks for the question. So why are the payoffs 2x minus 3? Okay, here is the answer. For each unit of effort, okay, each person gets x. How many units of effort are there? There are two, because there is one coming from player one, and there is another one coming from player two. So we have two units of effort, okay, one provided by each of the two players. Yes.
Yes. So I'm saying. Okay, what happens when, look at the one individual, when he exerts effort, on the one hand he has to pay three, okay, anyone exerting effort pays three. But there are benefits, okay, namely you get, you get an X, and you get an X from each and every one who provided effort. So in the top left corner, everyone has to pay three, because everyone is exerting effort. On the other hand, Three is, the cost of three is not the only thing accepting the payoffs. You also get to enjoy two X's, one for each person exerting effort. So the, the payoff is going to be the difference between the two X you earn and the three you have to pay. So that's why it's two X minus three, okay? Now I'm going to look at games with specific X's. I'm going to look at low axis, high axis, and intermediate axis. Okay, once I have those three down, I'm going to be able to move to the theory of leadership of Komai. Yes, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Okay, I. I think it's yeah. Hello? Yeah, that's okay. You can hear me? Okay, this is going to help me a lot, I think. Uh, so now I'm going to plug in different values of x. In an attempt to be pedagogical, I put the old game tree up in the far right corner, so you can see that one. So you have the 2x minus 3 and the zeros and everything up there. And then in the slightly larger game, I'm doing the same thing again, but I'm plugging in a specific value of x. So let's assume that x equals 3, okay? If you have x equals 3, then 2x minus 3 here is going to be 2 times 6 minus 3, so you get a 9. Same for the other player. x minus 3 is 6 minus 3, so you get 3. x is 6 and 0 is 0. So you get this matrix, okay? Now let's think about what players will do in this game. Okay, and it should be pretty clear. Take it from a viewpoint of player one. Player one doesn't know what player two is doing, but he doesn't really care because nine is bigger than six and three is bigger than zero. So whatever the other player is doing, he's better off choosing high effort because the rewards are so great, okay? So he will. The other player, it's all symmetric, the same logic applies. You com he will compare nine and six here, and nine is bigger than six. So if, if he knew that the other player was choosing E, he would choose E himself. Of, cor of course, if the other player is choosing N, he would also choose E, so because three is bigger than zero. Three is bigger than zero, nine is bigger than six. He doesn't have to worry, he can choose high effort. Yes? Easy and a nice outcome. Great outcome, as I wrote. Now I'm going to look at, the, let's think of, uh, you know, the situation as involving different axes, right? So now we have a situation which is less productive. There is still, yes, question. Can you go back one slide? Yes. Well, I think what you are now saying is that you like to modify the game to the one coming on the next slide. Okay. So bear with me two seconds. Okay, I think this is the game you had in mind, but tell me if I'm wrong when I'm done with the presentation. Okay, so here is a game where X is lower, okay? You don't get the full kick of, of, of six. Okay, you only get the kick of two, x is two. 
Now again, if I take the, the game we talked about, I'm not going to repeat it, but you know where the payoffs came from, and I'm plugging in the different values of x here, okay, then here instead of a 6 on the last slide I get a 2, here I get 2 minus 3 is minus 1, 2x minus 3 is 2 times 2 minus 3 is 1, so you get this game, okay? Think about how you would play this game, okay? Now, you know, if you exert effort, effort gives 2 to everyone, it gives 2 to you, but the cost is 3, so you don't want to do it, okay? And you can see that in the figure because, you know, 2 is bigger than 1, and 1, 0 is bigger than minus 1, so whatever player 2 is doing, you're better off choosing no effort than high effort, okay? And similarly for the other player, no effort is better than high effort, and they end up here getting zero each. And that's actually a bad outcome in this case, because if both of them had exerted effort, this is, may look paradoxical to you, okay, they would have been better off. So what I've just been saying is that if you look at this situation from the individual's point of view, it's not rational to exert effort when x is so low. You want to do no effort, but when everyone is doing it, it produces an outcome which is bad for everyone in the sense that it would have been better had both of them uh, chosen high effort, okay? Am I right that this is if, what you had in mind? Yeah, well, right. My distribution function is, is taking a stand. I'm, say, I'm really saying that for each of your units of effort, there will be 2x produced because there are two players and you get an x to everyone, so you get half of it, okay? And you're saying often I get less than half. Fine. Yes. Uh, anyway, this illustrates that there is a conflict between the individual rationality and what's good for everyone. This is the most famous game in game theory, okay? Many of you will have heard about the prisoner's dilemma. This is a prisoner's dilemma. It usually is told with a different story, which I won't tell about prisoners being held in custody and the police interrogating them. But you know, the structure of prisoner's dilemma is much more general than that. It can come up in different settings. Here it came up in my uh, organization setting, okay? Right? Why? Well, because the individual has to pay the cost of his effort, but the benefits of the effort is shared by everyone, so he only gets a small slice, that's the intuition, okay? So here you have a, actually an inefficient outcome in the sense that both of them would prefer to be up here as opposed to being down there. Now I go to a new game where x is even lower. x is going to be equal to 1. I mean, in this case, it should be clear that there is no benefit to doing effort, and in fact, not to anyone, because, you know, if I exert effort, the cost is 3, and we get x for each of the two, so that's 2 times 1 is 2, is smaller than 3, right? And if you plug in the numbers here, plug in x, you get 1 minus 2 minus 1 minus 1. You should do no effort, because 1 is bigger than minus 1, and 0 is bigger than minus 2. Right? And similarly for the other player. So here, there is no inefficiency. It's right. Not, X can be so low that it actually doesn't, uh, uh, it's not a good idea to exert high effort. Okay? Unlike the previous situation where it was in principle a good idea, but it wouldn't happen. Did I have another question? No. Okay. So to summarize, Depending on x, I put the game with x equals 6 to the left, x equals 2 in the middle, x equals 1 to the right. I had good outcomes in the games on the sides, but I had a bad one in the middle, okay? Now, let's assume that, you know, 
you work in a firm or so, exits come, sometimes you get great opportunities and then you have high exits, sometimes you have bad opportunities and you have low exits, right? Let's suppose, just for the sake of argument, that you get one of these three exits with equal probability. You, with probability one over three, you get a low x equals one. One third of the time you get a high x, x is equal to six. And one third of the time it's this intermediate x equals two case, right? If everyone observed the x and chose according to our preceding analysis, well, we know they would get nine here, they would get zero in the middle and zero over there. So in expectation, the payoff would be one third times nine plus one third times zero plus one third times zero. So on average, they get three. Yes? Okay. Now we're going to compare it to a new situation. We're going to change the nature of the organization, okay? So now you come to the heart of learning about the contribution, the key idea of this paper I mentioned by uh, 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 Kumai, um, Stegeman, and Hermelin, okay? So they say, hmm, you know, this information about what makes uh, how productive a uh, 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 project is, we can imagine that we can decide how to hand it out, you know? Suppose we make one of the two players uh, to get this information only, okay? And we'll call that fellow a leader, right? So one player gets to, let's say, uh, that the one choosing uh, the row, okay, gets private access to information about X. So instead of everyone knowing that X is either one or two or six, everyone knows it will be one of the three with equal probability, but here we just tell player one, okay? And then instead of them simultaneously choosing high effort or low effort, we let the guy who has the information about X, player one, the row player, make his choice before the other player. So he lets the other fellow see the choice, okay? But he doesn't tell what X is. He just leaves for the other one to make his own inferences and then choose high or low effort. Okay, then you can improve on the previous situation and the smart idea is to do this. The leader, player one, the row player, will choose to exert high effort if X takes either the high or the intermediate value. X is six or two. Whereas he will choose no effort if X goes the low one, okay? Let's see what happens when you do this. Okay, so here are the three games. And I'm proposing that the leader does as indicated in purple. He chooses E if it's X equals six or X equals two. Otherwise he chooses N, okay? Now, of course, if the follower understands that this is what the leader is doing, then of course, when N is choose, chosen, uh, the response, you know, uh, the, the, the follower will figure out that the leader has chosen this row, so, the follower will say zero is bigger than minus two, I want zero, so he would choose n as well, and they end up here. Okay, that's unproblematic. The interesting thing is what happens over here. Suppose the follower sees that the leader has chosen the high effort, but he hasn't told the follower what x is. Okay, then the follower knows it's e we're either here or here, okay? So he has to think it's equally likely it's either, right? So what's the choice of the follower? The cho choice of the follower is to say, hey, I can choose E and then I'm either here or here. So I get either nine or one, nine or one, nine or one. The average of nine and one is five. So he will value this choice of E at five. On the other hand, he could choose no effort and he would value that at six or two, six or two, six or two. The average is four, right? Five is bigger than four. What do you want, five or four? You would want five, right? So you choose the high effort. 
So you, the, the, the idea of, of uh, keeping the information about X private to player one and calling him a leader is that they managed to coordinate on the good outcome in the middle game. You solve the prisoner's dilemma part of the situation, okay? Right? So, you see, instead of having, if you remember, well, I can show you. Whoops, wrong direction. I used to have efficient, inefficient, efficient. Whoops, going too far again here. Where am I? Do, do, whoops. Sorry. I went here and I got all of them efficient. And if you look at the expected payoff, it's one third times nine plus one terms, no longer zero, but one times one third times zero. So you get 10 thirds on average, which is higher than three. So you gain something, yes? Okay, now you learned the essence of uh, Kumai Stegemann and Hermelin's theory. And I wrote wow in the margin. Okay, now, of course, as I said, this was a simplified account. You know, their theory is more complicated, more rich on nuances and so on. But the essence is really what I told you. The theory really tells a story. You know, it's a thought-up world which is much more abstract than the, the world you probably know. And you may think, why so simple? Okay, lots of economic theory has this kind of... Uh, 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 snapshot character trying to highlight some feature of reality rather than incorporating everything. But at this point, you know, you should think, I think, that, hey, Martin has told me this piece of science fiction, basically. You know, is it empirically relevant? Right? And here lab experiments may help. Okay? And the study by Kumai, Grossman and Dieters, recently published in managerial and decision economics, they run an experimental test. And it's essentially concerned with, you know, whereas the real world is more rich than the theory, in the lab you can create a world which looks just like the theory, okay? So they, what they do is they invite students to the lab, okay? They describe these games. And they say things tantamount to saying with probability one-third, X will be this and this and that, right? The world that the students in the lab encounter will look exactly as the mathematics, but translated into a lab setting where you can make choices between E and N and you get paid uh, uh, euros this and that way. I guess it was dollars in that case, okay? And... Then they do, they have what's called treatments. So when you do experiments, you know, you run different settings. And if you change some specific detail, you get two different treatments. And then you can compare because you know that the only difference between the two treatments is the little thing that you changed. So what do they change? Well, they run the game the way I told you first with X known and announced. And then they get certain outcomes. And they do it the other way with the leader, where they say, hey, we're appointing player one the leader, he gets to observe X, he's not going to tell the other fellow, but he will make his choice before the other one follows up, right? And then I'm not going to give you the details, you can find the paper if you want to, but you know, basically what happens is that the theory is largely supported, okay? So now you still have to worry that maybe this theory is too much of a snapshot of reality, but as a metaphor for some capturing something important, you have a stronger belief in it than if you didn't have this support in the experimental test. Yes? Okay. Um, that was study number one. Study number two coming up. Are you ready? New example. When I, Tito asked me, you know, I said I didn't do anything on leadership, but I started thinking, yes, a question? Sorry, yes. Yes, please. Yeah, you know, I, I think uh, the question concerns how large X is, okay? You know, the, the theory is being confirmed, so you 
Ah, how large it's being confirmed. It's okay. My answer will be this. Okay. Um, when you're doing lab experiments of this sort, it's hard to draw quantitative comparisons between the real world and the lab. What you can get is qualitative insights. Here the qualitative insight would come in the form of, is it the case that it's a good idea in principle to appoint a leader or not? And you would test that simply with a statistical uh, significance test, you know, of whether, let's say, uh, uh, something like, are the payoffs uh, in the second session statistically significantly higher than the payoffs in the first session? And you know, you look at the data, you see that what actually happens is that people play most of the time the efficient outcomes, okay? In the other case, they don't. So that's, that's what I can say. Okay. Now, new example, when Tito asked me to give this lecture, I asked myself, hmm, did I do any experiment on leadership? And I had to honestly at first say, no, I didn't. But then in retrospect, I started thinking, hey, I have this paper uh, that I did that I can actually interpret in retrospect as concerning a feature of leadership. So I decided that's what I will tell you about, okay? So I have a paper uh, in Econometrica 2006 with Gary Charnas, which is an experimental test of theory, uh, which, uh, uh, you know, related to theory that's developed by me and uh, Pier Paolo Battigalli, who's my colleague at Bocconi. Uh, and you can see my co-authors on the picture there. Um, and also me. Okay. So now, um, part two of the game theory lecture, you learned about game matrices. Now you will learn about game trees. There are basically two ways that game theories describe strategic situations where people in interact and influence each other. You've learned about one, you will now learn about the other. So game trees, game trees are sort of explicit on the, the order in which players move. So here is a situation which you can interpret as an organization, and I'm gonna loosely interpret player one as a leader, okay? So think of A as sort of the firm or the boss or someone who's running an uh, uh, organization, okay? And the question for the, this person is whether to hire or not a worker, okay? So I will look at interaction between this boss and the worker, okay? And the boss, starts the game, so the game starts at the top. Game trees, at least people draw them differently. I like my game trees to grow from top down. Sorry about that. Okay, so they are Babylonian game trees. Um, you know, if you don't hire, or hire. Now, the numbers at the end of the game tree are gonna depict payoffs, okay? So, uh, let's assume that if you don't hire, then they get five each, okay? If the boss hires, then the outcome actually depends on the worker or the hired person, B. B can again choose whether to put in effort or not to put in effort, okay? And this time, we're going to have an effort cost of four. So the payoff is going to be 14 if he doesn't exert effort and 10 otherwise. So it's costly to exert effort. Why would you want to do it? Well, because it's actually beneficial to the boss. Okay? So if you don't... I'm writing always the boss's payoff on top and the worker's payoff below. So if you, if you are hired and you exert no effort, you get a fine payoff of 14, but the boss, boss gets nothing. On the other hand, if you're willing to spend your $4 worth of effort, yes, it costs you four, but the other guy gains 10. So you get 10 each. You know, consider this, uh, compare that to what happens if you don't hire the guy, then you get five each. There are gains from trade. This is the simplest model you could imagine to illustrate uh, a situation with potential gains and trade between a boss and his worker, right? But there is tension, much like in the prisoner's dilemma, except now it's played out sequentially, because, you know, clearly you have to rely on the guy 
to, to, to exert effort, right? And if it doesn't, you're, you're uh, in trouble, right? Okay. Now you wonder what is this star going on, okay? And I could, if I had hours, I could talk about the star. So, uh, Per Paolo Battigalli and I, we have this, uh, um, so a large part of my research is concerned with the following, okay? So economists throughout the decades have uh, used maybe, let's say, more, they've been more inclined to use mathematical methods than many other folks in other neighboring social sciences. But they have done it at the cost of making rather simplified assumptions about human nature, like, you know, everyone is maximizing profit is a standard assumption where you just look at the dollars. So much of what I do is trying to incorporate more uh, a richer human element into the analysis. So emotions and caring about, uh, uh, you know, getting even, being kind to people who are kind to you and things like that, right? And the star I put in here to indicate something about that. So imagine that you don't, as a player, you wouldn't only maximize your, as a worker, you wouldn't only look at how much you gain, but you think of the other fellow. Then you know, here is this boss, he's offering me a contract and he's saying, look, Martin, we can both gain and get 10 instead of five, right? I would feel awful if I, if I don't work hard, right? And get a 14 and he gets zero. So the, the star is my bad conscience, okay? Now, the qu I wrote the star because I don't have time to, to give you details for the star might be, but I want you to, th it's red because it's sort of emotional, okay? Uh, and what Pierpaolo Battigalli and I do is we develop a theory, a general theory of how people might feel guilt, okay? And it follows from the scholarship of many good psychologists that people tend to feel guilt when they hurt relationship partners. And that depends on the relationship partner's beliefs. So if someone, you know, imagine that these fellows look one another in the eye and, and you know, uh, player B says, you know, I promise that I'll exert effort, right? So he manages to shape the beliefs of the other guy. Then he would feel terrible for not exerting the effort, okay? So in the theory, if I were to discuss it in detail, we would have this would be a mathematical formula, and it depends, it describes the beliefs of player B, the second player, the worker, about the belief of player A, about the probability that player B will exert effort, okay? Okay, so that's the star. Now add to this situation the fact that people in organizations talk to each other, right? They do things like what I said. They shake hands, they look one another in the eye, they say, look, I realize that there are trust issues here where, you know, uh, you might think as a boss that I would not exert effort, but hey, buddy, I promise you, you hire me and I'll work hard, right? And maybe that breeds a self-fulfilling circle of beliefs about beliefs so that people actually do this. Yes? Promises in particular, promises in particular may play a role in this. Psychologists have documented this in experiments way back, uh, but you know, they didn't connect it specifically to this mathematical machinery that we like to operate with, okay? So here is the idea, you take the situation and you know, it may be good in itself, just maybe you have a big star to start with, but the star will become bigger if you let people talk. Okay, now I told you another story. So again, an experiment might shed light on it. Let's see how I'm doing on time. I think I'm still doing okay, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, not that many slides left. Okay, so the idea is now to run an experiment. So we invited subjects to the lab. We described exactly this, stru this structure where they move in sequence. The first fellow gets to play the boss and he can hire or not, and the other fellow gets to uh, subsequently choose no effort or effort if he's hired, okay? Um, we had treatments, and the treatments concerned whether or not we had communication in the picture. So in one case, um, you know, we did this game without communication. In the other one, 
we had this pre-play message opportunity where actually B could send a message to A, okay? So in particular, B could send a promise, you know, before they started playing about how he would behave, okay? Then we measured the star. I'm not going to go into details, but remember I said mathematically the star is describing beliefs about beliefs about behavior, okay? In the lab, what we did was operate with guesses. So we did things like telling player A, hey, you matched with one of the fellows in the other room as your fellow B. Now we ask you to guess, you know, what percentage of the fellows in the other, in the other room choose effort, right? So we get data, if you will, and we rewarded them monetarily for accuracy in guesswork. So we get data on player A's beliefs. Then we went to player B and said, hey, we just asked the other fellow to guess what you are doing. Now we ask you to guess the guess. And the, again, we ask, we reward according to accuracy in the guesswork. So the guess guesses become uh, uh, data that we can use to test the theory, okay? And then we have research hypotheses which event, uh, uh, essentially say that if you have words in the picture, then the stars will become higher, people will become more emotional and, you know, worry more about uh, uh, not living up to the other fellow's expectations. And that will boost hiring and effort, so you get good outcomes. Good outcomes are improved. You get 10-10 more often than 5-5. And in particular, what words might matter? Well, promises, right? So we can sort of tell a consistent story why promises via feelings of guilt shape trust and cooperation, okay? So here is just to give you a little bit of flavor of it, it's a sample message. So they got a sheet, play B got a sheet of paper and it says, you may print a message to A below if you wish. Let's look only at the second half of the message. You know, this fellow uh, 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 writes, uh, My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty. Of thee I sing, land where my fathers died. Land of the pilgrim's pride, on every mountainside, let freedom ring. George W. Bush wants you to go in, Bin Laden says out. Okay, I, they, they write in and out. I, I cheated a bit on the slides, just to make it pedagogical, I say effort and no effort. In the experiment, uh, and we had higher and not higher, in the experiment, these things were described in different words. They were out and in, the choices, but otherwise it was essentially the same game, okay? So you can see, he's talking about the game, he's trying to make the other fellow go in, and further up, he's making some kind of promise uh, regarding how he would behave. We had many funny messages uh, like this. Anyway, about the results, so the hypothesis again uh, amounts to words boosting the star, boosting hiring and effort choices, and largely it was supported again, okay? So uh, just to give you a snapshot of the data, if I, if I make this little figure here in the no communication treatment, you know, this histogram would show you uh, uh, the blue bars are the frequency of hiring decisions, the green bars are the frequency of effort decisions, high effort, and the red bars are the frequencies of outcomes all the way down here, the good one, right? Okay. And then I do the same thing for the, the, the treatment with the messages where B communicate, and the point is that everything shoots up, okay? So the words help foster trust and cooperation. Okay, so we're coming to the words to close and you know, then you have an opportunity to ask me questions and you can stick to the theories we said or you can ask more generally about anything about game theory experiments or psychology and economics. But let me wrap up first. So in this second story, you know, the leadership spin would be that a leader may foster trust and cooperation by offering an employee, in this case player B, a communication opportunity once you give people a voice, promises will be issued and kept. 
issued and kept. So that helps uh, uh, foster trust and cooperation. So the story involves words, moving beliefs, and via guilt, this influences choices. I'll end on a, on, a, on a cautionary note here, because, you know, so I've told you one story why you might get uh, people to be truthful and trustworthy, yes, and not to lie and so forth. So can we, can we imagine some other reason why people tell the truth to foster trust and cooperation? It turns out I found an answer in Rome when I was there recently, and I can't deny that to you. It's going to be my last slide, so it's coming here. Okay. Thanks for your attention. Okay, there are three persons uh, requiring the word. Yes, first is uh, Professor. Birner. Okay. <laughs> yes, well, the uh, penultimate slide says um, promises issued and kept. And of course, the kept hides a large field of problems. Did you do um, experiments on a repetition of the game? And if you did so, uh, to what extent did the results differ from, let's say, the more traditional uh, repeated prisoner's dilemma approach? Okay, so I'll repeat the question because I think maybe the microphone wasn't super... I, did everyone hear the question or...? So the, uh, the question concerns whether we repeated this experiment or whether it was done once, and if repeated, how uh, did... Uh, uh, um, uh, you know, that um, uh, matter. Um, the thing is, we did not repeat, okay? So, economists have asked, in many ways, the general question, why do people uh, cooperate? And, you know, things that have been highlighted concern, well, you can write a binding contract so that you will punished if you don't uh, cooperate, but you know, that has downsides because maybe it's costly. Or economists, another common line, which is implicit in your question, is, well, many of the relationships we have are repeated. So you wouldn't want to take advantage of someone for short-run gain because they would punish you in the future, right? And there are well-established uh, theories about both these things. When we came to this, we came from the viewpoint of thinking, hey, these feelings of guilt and the psychology might be, let's say, a third reason, right? And in order to, to highlight that, we actually wanted to abstract, not to disregard the other two, but to abstract away from them. So the only way to abstract away from them is to have a one-shot setting. So that's what we did, right? And then we told our story for the one-shot case. So I don't have... Uh, uh, repeated game data for that reason. Next question. Um, thank you. Very inspiring. I'm not an economist. Uh, so, just to put in a practical way, um, when you talk about uh, emotion and behavior economics, uh, I would like to know whether how you're going to shift uh, from uh, the theory of games uh, into the practical uh, uh, behavior of uh, people managing uh, and leading teams. Uh, so my question is, uh, how are you going to quantify the behavior and the beliefs in the first place? And the second is more, uh, um, you talk a lot about efficiency. So we know now that uh, emotions uh, are drivers uh, of motivations. So the question is, how are you going to measure in the future the impact of emotions uh, and uh, the growth of efficiency? Um. Okay, um, so 
I'll start with the second question because I think I have uh, better on uh, more. Uh, I have an answer to that one. Uh, so I started out talking about efficiency, yes, and I was sort of highlighting what was and what was not efficient, and implicitly I was referring only to the monetary payoffs, right, and which is what economists traditionally have done, right? You're very right in pointing out that now, if I'm starting to play around what, with what actually motivates people, okay, uh, then, you know, we should measure also efficiency differently because the new ways to motivate people might be part of what is efficient and what is not, okay? And I think it's fair to say that this is a tricky issue which... Uh, uh, um, I don't have full answers to what to do exactly, although I feel very strongly in specific examples. I mean, certainly in this example, you know, uh, uh, there is no tension between the two. They get 10 each, right? Certainly 10 each would be considered a better outcome, also taking emotions into account than five each. And probably the outcome where one of the fellow gets 14 and the other one gets zero is certainly a terrible outcome for the one getting zero, you would imagine. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's an important uh, question uh, uh, and there may be uh, other situations where it can be hard to, um, to uh, look at, to, to, um, I, these are tricky issues, okay? I think you can do two steps. You should first look at the, the sort of the standard economist way of doing it because that will be, give you some insight. If everyone is better off in t terms of monetary outcomes, that says something. It doesn't say the whole picture, mm -hmm. so you need to be mindful. Yes. And the other question, uh, how to quantify and put this into practice. Um, you know, I, I guess I'm not sure I know. I mean, I took away a little bit here. I said, you know, give your employees an opportunity to talk. I mean, I was trying to take something away. You have to... No, I think it's fair to say that, you know, attempts to... Economists used to be sceptical to incorporating psychology and economic analysis. They would say things like, yes, it matters, but it's second-order effects and, you know, we are fine to abstract away from it. It's probably noise. I think recently people have started to argue that taking emotions into account will actually change outcomes systematically. Uh, but it's a new trend, okay, and much work lies in the future. Uh, I'm, I really appreciate your work, and I think it's a very important work. Uh, so don't, don't take my question as, uh, 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 as something uh, of scepticism. But um, if you use only student in doing this, because the question is, what about if you don't use student? And what about if you use student from Asia or from Latin America? Because the question is that very often this sort of uh, theory confirmation, and by the way, the question of probability is very important every time you do this kind of experiments because uh, significance is very important and, and variability is very large. So you have to be sure that then you have a sort of reasonable quantification. But again, the, the most important question for me is, have you have introduced enough cultural and social variability in your experiments to say that the, the trend is the trend of your theory? Yeah, so um, I'm going to answer uh, by uh, first um, apologizing and then defending, okay? The, the apologizing part is that, you know, imagine researchers who sit in universities and want to test stuff in the lab, you know. It's very convenient to use uh, students, okay? Students are, first of all, you know, if you worry about stakes in experiments, it's pretty good to use students. They don't have super much money, so, you know, if you pay them uh, 10, 15 euros, uh, that's probably more to them than it would be to to certain other subjects. So you get fairly motivated students, which is nice. Uh, you know, if you're testing theories that uh, imply sort of uh, complicated reasoning, you know, students are pretty smart. So, you know, it's, 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 you don't worry so much about um, 
well, you know, for many purposes they are very good subjects, okay? For some purposes, of course, they are not representative and, uh, and one needs to be mindful of that. However, then you also have to acknowledge that there is a big chunk of work done outside uh, the, uh, the lab. So, you know, using experimental games similar to what I've described, you know, for instance, anthropologists in the last 10 to 15 years have really starting to take the tools of experimental economists to heart and go out in the different parts of the world and, and compare cultural differences, you know. And you can take a game like the one I had in the last, for instance, which is called the trust game, you know, because player A has to trust player B to do things. And you can really compare uh, trust levels in different cultures. So some of this work is done. Uh, let me say one more thing, like, for instance, there is a literature, which I haven't talked about, but on pricing in financial markets, okay? Financial economists debate about how we should uh, understand price movements in, 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 in the real uh, world, you know? Should we think of manias and panics, or could we have more sort of fundamental theory to, uh, as developed by economists to describe it? There is a heavy debate, and it will never finish, okay, because no one observes the fundamental values in reality. Well, in the lab you can actually control fundamental values because you can define the dividend structure and have a market and so on, right? So you can test these theories in a good way and people have done it on students and you get certain results. Now, in this connection, many scholars or commentators wondered, you know, okay, you get these results with students. Would you get them in with professionals, okay? So Vernon Smith, you may have heard his name. If you know one experimental economist, it should be him. He got the Nobel Prize, the Nobel Memorial Prize in 2002 for his work in experimental economics. And he was starting this uh, uh, series of experiments testing where the bubbles occur. So, uh, you know, excessive prices relative to fundamentals in in, in markets, and they do with students. You get huge bubbles. And at that point, someone said, okay, but these are students. Would it happen with professional traders? So he actually took the effort and went down to some Pacific Stock Exchange or whatever it was, and invited traders to his lab, right? And cranked up the stakes, I think, to, to make them happy and played. And they made even bigger bubbles. <laughs> so, you know, that's one example of... of uh, so people are taking these concerns um, um, into question, and they, sometimes they are more important than others, but yes. Are there other questions? If not, can I add uh, my one, one question from my side? Uh, I think that you are right when you say that economists uh, did not care too much about leadership in the literature. You started by saying this at the beginning. Uh, um, I, think that, I think that you're right, totally right, but at the same time, I believe that uh, some uh, aspects of leadership uh, are in some way nested in uh, some uh, economic phenomena studied also by game theory. For example, you cannot have leadership without having some form of hierarchical structure, you know. You need a boss, but the boss is something, you know, at the top of the hierarchy. Even if it is not a formal hierarchy, but nevertheless, to have leadership, you need this, okay? Now, if you think to some uh, games, uh, very common, uh, commonly used in uh, behavioral and experimental economics, like the ultimatum game or the investment game, where there is some form of sequentiality in, in the game itself, uh, well, in that case, uh, you can see some form of hidden hierarchy, meaning that, for example, in the ultimatum game, uh, the ultimatum game is a very simple game. It works in this way. There are two players, and the, one is the proposer and the other one is the receiver. The proposer is endowed by getting money. He receives money, for example, 10 euros, and he has to decide how much to send to the, to the receiver of this amount of money, some X. And then what the receiver can do is only to accept or reject. If uh, he or she rejects, then both of the players lose the money, not, not nothing, they get nothing, zero. 
If he accepts, of course, they share the, the pie in the way that the proposer decided to share. Okay, this kind of game, with, with, which is a sequential, uh, can induce some form of, of hierarchical relationship. So you can imagine the proposer like a leader, in a sense. You understand what I mean? Do you think that this could be a, a way to uh, look at uh, the leadership uh, issue, at least from uh, this perspective of the use of power and hierarchy within games, uh, or it is not something that can be studied? Well, so, so uh, off the top of my head, I'm uh, uh, d d d first not sure how to answer, but then I get the following association, so you tell me if it's related to uh, what you said, okay? So I'll come back to these uh, anthropology experiments I mentioned. It used to be that the game Luigi mentions, the ultimatum bargaining game, People used to say, you can, and this is coming also to the student question, okay? You pick students anywhere in the world and you can play with large stakes or small stakes, you get the same outcome. Basically, low ball offers get rejected and that's actually anticipated, so people offer a fair chunk of money, often half of the pie, okay? They don't uh, try to take advantage of the others and they shouldn't because they would be punished by rejections. Okay, that used to be the case that people thought this was a universal pattern until the anthropologists came and started playing the game in different cultures, okay? Then you do get very different outcomes, actually, that somehow from an anthropologist point of view, I think they argue are very, you know, useful for understanding the culture. Now, of course, in this, here comes the leadership connection then, but I'm shooting from the hip, okay? You would imagine that maybe you have uh, different leaders in these societies, maybe they are matriarchal or patriarchal in different cases, and if, um, um, you know, maybe, suppose you compare matriarchal and patriarchal societies, maybe what you said would have implications for different uh, outcomes depending on whether the first mover is a man or a woman in these societies. But I don't know. Is that a useful uh, angle? Thank you very much. Okay. I think that we can uh, close here. I thank you very much for your very interesting talk. And uh, welcome to Frank Thank you, Lugis. Thanks, everyone.